The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to today's WCET webcast. Post-secondary institution data security overview and requirements. My name is Lindsay Downs and I manage communications here for WCET. Thank you for joining us today. A few housekeeping items before we get started. You can use the questions box in the GoToWebinar panel for any questions and information exchange. We will have a recording of today's webcast as well as PowerPoint and any resources mentioned available next week. If you'd like to follow along the PowerPoint today, you can download that in the handouts pane in the GoToWebinar platform. And we're going to have a great discussion on Twitter today during the webcast. You can participate and follow along using hashtag WCET webcast. A quick overview of where we're going today. We'll, talk, we'll do some introductions of our moderators and panelists, talk about data security, data breaches, how federal student aid and the Department of Education can help with data security. We'll save some time for a questions and answers period and then have some concluding thoughts. And just a quick reminder that we will be moder monitoring the questions panel for any technical issues as well as content questions. So please add your questions to the question box. We'll talk about those content questions during the Q&A period after the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce our wonderful moderators for today. We have Marianne Boki, who's the Senior Associate at, at Ensham's, and Cheryl Dowd, who directs the State Authorization Network and is our new WCET and WICHE Cyber Fellow. Take it away, ladies. Hi everyone, this is Cheryl Dowd. Um, thank you, Lindsay, for introducing us. I just wanted to uh, very quickly tell you all how pleased we are that SAN and WCET could come together to provide this uh, very important webinar today. Um, as the SAN members have heard, we have wanted to make sure that we provide information about certain types of issues that are ancillary but important to the compliance work that are that's happening at the institutions, as well as WCET is always um, on the forefront of sharing information about what institutions need to be aware of in the um, working of their innovations at their institutions. I'm going to turn it over to Mary Ann now, though, so that we can uh, move along to our presentation. Mary Ann? Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Lindsay. I am just pleased to introduce Tina Rodrig, who is the Senior Advisor, Cybersecurity, Office of the Chief Operating Officer at the Federal Student Aid U.S. Department of Education in Washington, D.C. She has over 25 years experience in these issues, and we are very happy to have her here today. We know how busy she is, and she does a lot of the conference circuit. In fact, that's how I met her not six months ago. And those of you who know me know that when I find someone good, I try and share them with the rest of the network. So I was just tickled that she said she could come and do this for us today. She's really gonna walk us through her presentation and then leave some time at the end for Q&A. Um, I'm cognizant of the time, we only have an hour. So I'm gonna just go ahead and turn this over to Tina at this point. Uh, I will be monitoring the, the chat box and if I see a question that needs, that needs immediate answering, I will interrupt Tina and ask her to take care of that. But otherwise we'll save the questions uh, for the end. With that, Tina. Hello and welcome. I can't wait to go over my slides with you today, but before I do, I just want to point out before we go off this slide, I have a spelling of my name. None of that is a typo. I am in fact a two-eyed Tina, and my last name does not have a Q, a Z, or an S. And I get this question a lot, and part of the reason why I point that out is just beyond my simple narcissism, but be also because at the point where you run into problems, if you have a breach, if you have a question, you're going to want to contact me. I am the person who helps everyone when it comes to post-secondary institutions or institutions of higher education with their cyber issues. So I can be reached at tina.rodrig at ed.gov, but I can only be reached at that email. 
if you spell my name correctly. So I get a lot of angry phone calls where someone will say things like, I sent you an email two weeks ago and you haven't responded. And the truth is, it's not just that I'm lazy, but sometimes I don't even get the email. So I want to make sure that we're all clear on that. And that way I can be of most benefit to you, not only today, but moving forward. So Lindsay, if we could go to the next slide. So how I put together this presentation are based off of the questions I receive when there is a breach, specifically at an institution of higher education. I want to help everyone understand these questions. And you, you may have others that will answer at the end, but these, these are the big ones that I normally get. People don't understand whose job it is, why they need to worry about it, what the requirements even are, what is a breach, when do they report it, how do they report it, anything along that line. Um, and, and this is all critical information for you to be successful because although compliance is an important part and we're gonna cover that quite distinctly as we move forward, but the real goal is to get you to ground truth security, not excellent looking paperwork that does not reflect the reality of ground truth security underneath it. We want you to be safe, healthy, and whole. That's our only goal. So if um, we could go to the next slide, Lindsay. I just wanna start by saying, and these um, build, unfortunately. So. When there is a data breach, the first person who I reach out to, uh, click please, is the president of a school. We will send our letter initially to the president and it's our assumption um, as we click through that um, they will work with their teams to include their chief information officer, their chief information security officer, and then further with any area where that breach was impacting, the registrars, the comptrollers, the treasurers, people in financial aid, the staff and faculty, because any and all of those people could be um, in charge of the area that caused the breach or related to the area that had held the data because they're all considered part and parcel of what needs to be protected. And then last but not least, um, they may need to work with parents, financial aid professionals, the users, the students, the applicants, uh, to make sure that everyone understands you know, what data was protected, uh, how it should have been protected if it wasn't. And the one person who's not on here, who should be, uh, there should be a dotted line to third party servicers, because often, uh, post-secondary institutions or institutions of higher education are sharing their data with third-party servicers as well. So all of these individuals have a very distinct role that needs to be taken care of when it comes to data security. Um, conversely, I will take a report of a breach from anyone on this page, and please believe I get calls from angry parents, concerned applicants, uh, students who think that their identity has been stolen or students who know that their identity has been stolen due to a school data breach. Um, I get it from faculty. I get it from anyone and everyone that you could imagine will send us a report uh, to make sure that we are appropriately examining um, what is going on. And, and to be clear, we examine every report and we reach out to every school to make sure that they are on top of their game. In fact, there are articles out today reiterating the importance of the president because from an education perspective, we feel that the president is where cybersecurity starts and ends. That if they do not emphasize, if they do not prioritize, then the rest of the staff will unfortunately not prioritize and not emphasize either. So we are very clear in who we send our letter to and it is expressly on purpose because we wanna make sure that each institution is on notice that this is an administrative capability that everyone needs to be very aware of to the top of the chain, whether it's the president, vice chancellor, whatever you're calling the, the boss. Uh, Lindsay, next slide, please. So this slide um, 
and thanks to Gartner for allowing us to use it, um, indicates that cybersecurity maturity is one of the ways that we are trying to review where uh, post-secondary institutions are. And I realize it's a very complex slide, so I will walk you through it. Looking all the way to the left, you will see under the initial level of security maturity, as measured by Gartner, that education as a sector is at the lowest or weakest level, which unfortunately also means that you are at the highest possible risk, and I can promise you that's often not just risk, it's ongoing issues that you're not aware of because of your low level security. And um, part of what we see is that uh, when there's a breach, this lack of maturity very much shows. The, there's no one in charge or Someone will say, oh, I'll just call my IT folks, as if cybersecurity is only technology. Um, the executives may or may not be aware at all. They may not even want to take the call uh, to let them know that they've had a breach. They may or may not have a chief information security officer or a CISO. And I don't necessarily mean that as someone in that title. It could be a vice president of IT information technology or someone who's fulfilling that role actively. Um, that there's no formal program at all, which is a requirement. There, the users aren't, don't know, like, aren't trained to include the students. There's no policies, there's no processes, there's no security organization. And so part of what we want to get you to is the fact that um, you need to work together in order to get it to that defined level where you're operating within a known risk tolerance um, because yeah, this institutions are in fact uh, financial institutions. And so you need to get to the appropriate level of security. And we realize it'll take time and that it will take an investment, but, but in the end, uh, you will be within that very well-controlled, well-established risk tolerance that you have mitigated everything you can and that you're actively seeking to correct the things that you can't and detect them and uh, move forward. So Lindsay, next slide, please. The other reason why you need to worry about it is because whether you realize it or not, uh, you are a treasure. Your emails are worth money, if only for the discounts that they can provide and the opportunities that they bring. Uh, your financial data is literally money, and people are trying to use that in order to steal it. And then last but not least, your intellectual property and research is the most valuable aspects of you. Um, they, they are nation-breaking without, without going too much further. And part of the reason why we ask uh, post-secondary institutions to report each and every breach um, if you could click, Lindsay, is because what we found is that if a school does not positively re um, respond to the first breach, then, uh, and that may or may not be FSA data, the second breach almost invariably is. So we need to make sure that you are taking care of, of your entire perimeter, your network, your software, every part where you hold store data to include the physical aspects and the administrative controls. They all need to be part and parcel of it. Um, additionally, another thing that you may not be thinking about but has become more and more prevalent is just the operating capacity you have itself is now a target. They may not be looking at your data at all. However, what they might be doing is trying to see where they can get in in order to attack others, which means that um, you could be causing major areas, and this is a, a growing area where they are using you to attack other people. So your poor security, hypothetically, could be causing others additional harm, for which, uh, according to my understanding, may increase your liability. So let's not let's not be like that. Let's work together. Let's um, improve everything so that they don't even get to to harm you or others 
through your through any chinks in your armor, so to speak. So next slide, please. So as mentioned previously, any school that participates in Title IV program is a financial institution. And that's not for, just from a education perspective, but also from a Graham-Leach-Bliley Act perspective, GLBA. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Well, the FTC is the one who is responsible, who is the regulatory authority. And you're not wrong. They are. However, education has put uh, the requirement to have GLB safeguards in your program participation and SAIG agreements. So from a contractual perspective, in order to participate in Title IV, you must have these, and we are using that as our enforcement mechanism. Uh, if you don't have GLB safeguards, then we may find you to be administratively incapable. And administratively incapable means that you are not I'm able to properly or appropriately administer Title IV funds. And what we do in that case where we feel like your cyber security position is such that you cannot protect our data or your connection to our systems is we terminate or suspend, depending on how egregious it is, your access to FSA systems. So you could be permanently disabled from participating in Title IV aid if your situation is uh, to that degree. Most of the time we just suspend though. We have considered more. But um, I just want you to be aware of what the potential risk is to you as an organization, to you as a post-secondary institution, if you don't have um, the appropriate controls in place that we, we care very deeply about cybersecurity. Uh, my new boss, Kathleen Smith, says over and over that she recognizes that it's very important. Uh, our secretary, Betsy DeVos, has uh, gone on the record to say that this is an area um, of great importance and that we are going to be enforcing it. So if you don't know what GLB safeguards are, let me walk you through it. So GLB safeguards are relatively straightforward. First, you have to have an implemented, documented data security program, right? So very straightforward. You, and when I say program, I don't mean a policy. I mean that you have a program like an academic program or an athletic program, that it is um, fully formed and um, completely in place and that everybody understands what the processes are and it's not just sitting on a shelf somewhere. And unfortunately, I do see a lot of that. Um, if you send me a policy, I will tell you not a program. If you insist that's the only thing that you have for a program, I will ask you to demonstrate and prove the enforcement mechanisms and how you've done that in the past. So just make sure that you have a fully documented, implemented, and well-maintained program. Second, you have to have a person in charge of it. And this has to be an employee. So this can't be outsourced. It has to be someone who works for the, for the institution who um, is actively working it. Because I could tell you, it happens very frequently where I will get a program and I will see a name in there as a person in charge and I will ask to talk to that person and they have left or they have retired or, or they'll tell me that uh, they were put on the program, but they don't actually do it. And that the problem we have at that point is means that if the person who's in charge isn't doing it, isn't getting done. So that you don't want to be in that situation where you could have been administratively capable had the person you put in charge of it been actually doing their job. And and in the end, we won't find the person responsible for that. We'll find the institution responsible for that. Next slide, please. So what the person is supposed to be in charge of is making sure that you have um, already considered all of the foreseeable internal and external risks to data security via formal documented risk assessments. Um, 
And so those risk assessments are supposed to be in three areas, specifically around employee training and management. So that last question would have been a management issue. Um, that your information systems, and I don't just mean your firewalls. A lot of people assume that information systems are just the perimeter. No, this includes your network, your software, anywhere data is processed, stored, transmitted, or disposed of. So if you think of your information systems a little more holistically to include how you log in, how you make sure that only the right people see it, then you understand the scope of which we're talking with these risk assessments should be too. And then last but not least, detecting, preventing, or responding to attacks, intrusions, or other system failures. So um, normally, if I give this uh, speech in person, I would ask how many people in the room have had a cyber incident of any sort in the last year. And painfully, I, I typically see very few hands. Um, and what I would like to suggest is that if you don't know of a cyber incident within the last year, that you don't have the mechanisms in place to detect it. And if you can't detect it, you can't respond to it and you certainly can't prevent it. Um, and I'm just, I'm not just talking technology again, I mean human systems as well as technology systems, administrative systems, like you have to have it on every front. Uh, once you have done those risk assessments and you've made sure that those threats are identified and the level of risk is assessed, then you need to make sure that you have put in place the appropriate controls and that you regularly test and monitor their effectiveness. So this, is, uh, this part in particular is what um, we are working with OMB to have audited uh, during uh, the regular audits. And we're also working with OIG to include that in their um, audit guides as well. Um, originally, I was very optimistic that we'd get it in 18. Um, however, it looks like it might be more of a 19 endeavor. You know how we work. Um, if there's any way to go a little slower, I will let you know. Um, but this is the part that you absolutely have to have in place. And the question I often get is, well, what's our runway? And the truth is that this law, as you saw previously, was put in place in 2002, which means that you don't have a runway, you need a rocket ship, right? You are supposed to already have this in place today in well working order. If GLB were a person, they would be driving a car today. So I just want you to stop and think, and I'm, I'm often accused of being a little scary, uh, but the truth is I'm only as scary as your data security situation is poor. So if, if, you're, if that all seems like too much, then let's go to the next slide because that's not the whole thing. Because and Tina, Tina, this is yeah. Marianne. And I, I apologize to interrupt you, but I was hoping you might have just a point of clarification very quickly. And I think it was maybe two slides back uh, you mentioned that the GLBA safeguards are developed, implemented, and maintained, documented data security program. And one of the questions that came up is, do you have an example of what constitutes a program versus a policy? Are you using those so, words interchangeably? Right. I am not using those words interchangeably. So a policy would be... Um, a rule that came from your organization that it, that I like to uh, uh, you know use as an example of a thou shalt not or thou shalt right. So a policy is a rule. It's documented. It's formal. However, a policy by itself is insufficient because if you have no enforcement mechanism for that policy, mm -hmm. then it is just a suggestion. Uh, so if what we're looking for uh, is to make sure that um, that these aspects that I'm talking about right now are included in your program. So the fact that you've done your risk assessments, the fact how you monitor them, how you uh, the monitor the controls that you've put in place to cancel the risks or mitigate the risks if you can't they can't be canceled, um, how you test, how you how you do that and, uh, and how you monitor to make sure. Um, and all of that needs to be in the same document, right? So uh, if, and that's 
exactly how we evaluate it in in the point where you have a you know so it starts at the top if you say oh i'm sending you my policy we're like mm, nope not supposed to be a policy it's supposed to be a program and the and it's supposed to outline who does what to whom at what point so the processes and procedures should be at least at a high level very clear um so that you know the named person is in there how how they are to progress so it's not just the what which is policy but the how which is program if that makes sense did i answer the question marian i think you did that was very helpful thank you and, and i apologize for the intrusion but i thought that was an important point to clarify before we went on so thank you tina oh no my pleasure um so what else is supposed to be in your program <laughs> is how you oversee service providers because the service providers need to be held to these same standards so you also need to, for your service providers, anywhere that they have your customer data, customer data being student data or FSA data, um, they need to protect it at the same level, right? So you uh, have to make sure that they're doing that. So there's two requirements here. Now, uh, just a short story. Part of what has happened is we get schools who have breaches and um, I mentioned when we were looking at the Apple that the first breach isn't always FSA data, but the second one almost always is. So we had a school, um, and lo and behold, they had two breaches back to back, and they did not respond to the first breach. And so the second breach, of course, was FSA data because that is exactly what happens. Um, and so we contacted the school because they did not self-report it. They We found out about it through the media, which is only the worst way for us to find it out, um, short of you attacking us directly, which unfortunately also happens. Um, so what uh, we contacted the school and we let them know that we were aware of the breach and they said, don't worry about it, we outsourced it, it's not our fault. So I wanna take a moment here to let you know that you can never, 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 outsource the responsibility for your data you can hire people to help you but it is always your responsibility to oversee and manage the security so one of the things that this particular school did is they sent me a contract and you see here that you have to have a contract in order it has to be in the contract that they are following these rules and but just by looking at the contract that I am NOT a lawyer by trade I work with a lot of lawyers and in fact if you get our data breach letter that was written by lawyers but um, if I look at it and as not a lawyer I can tell that there are issues so the first issue was the fact that they did not cite GLB as the data standard and it's great if you're using a higher standard but you have to be able to tell me how you are fulfilling these GLBA requirements and if you can't do that I suggest rather than trying to do the wrong thing then you should do the right thing and the, G the GLBA is the minimum requirement here um, secondly they the contracts allowed um, the service provider to report days and weeks later you have a very narrow window where you have to self-report any breach. And so they could never be compliant unless it was by the grace of God on that front. Last but not least, the school had reserved in the contract the responsibility for security design, configuration, and testing. And the breach itself was related to standing up um, a financial aid platform on, in a hosted way and the breach was related to a default password that happened at the beginning in 2014. So I can tell you based off of that breach, which it doesn't take a genius to hack into when you, you put the well-publicized default password in, that the one, the one to three things that did not happen there were security design, configuration, and testing. Right, because any sort of any sort of person who was professional who had done any of that uh, would have known. So you must make sure that the safeguards that you have in place 
at your institution carry through wherever that data flows so must the controls right and that it's your responsibility uh, to make sure that it is taken care of last but not least on a regular basis you are to evaluate and adjust your program for to make sure that if you have results from that testing so this is another thing that we would expect to see how you've been testing, how you've been monitoring, how you've been adjusting. Because I can tell you once again, when you haven't, it shows. And the easiest way to tell you that it shows is that you send me a document from say 2009. Well, I'm um, sorry, cyber in 2009 is not the cyber of 2018. It means that you have not been evaluating and adjusting. That has been a piece of shelfware that maybe someone with every righteous intention wrote but no one is necessarily looking at and that means that it's very far from ground truth at that point i will ask you the the situation with your testing or your monitoring how did you find out and uh, this is a very important question because what we find is that the average duration of a breach typically exceeds 200 days right so if you can't detect and monitor then you can't respond and it that breach will sit there for a very long time and they will continue to get data and steal from you and you won't even realize it's happening it's like a cyber pickpocket right um, we'll ask you about how your school is or sometimes we don't even need to ask about the institution because they will send me an information security program if they have one that describes an apple and i will look at the website and i will see applesauce it doesn't have the same colleges anymore it doesn't have the same names it doesn't have the same um, infrastructure maybe it's not even in the same location there may be new locations additional um, there's mergers divestitures all sorts of things Anytime you have anything like that or an executive change, that should be reflected in your information security program. Um, and, and you know your institution way better than I do. You know what's a significant material change. So anytime you have one of those things, I suggest you trot out your information security program, dust it off, polish it up, and give a presentation to someone about it, especially if you're getting new people or making a, a it, uh, hierarchical change make sure that everybody knows what is the program and who's supposed to do what to whom and when Lindsay next slide please so one of the questions that I'm getting um, a lot lately is about GDPR or the general data protection regulation out of the EU and if I were doing this uh, in person, I would ask how many of the schools in place are international? And very few will raise their hand. And then I will ask them how many international students they have, and some of them will raise their hand. And I will ask how many international employees they have, faculty, staff, anyone, and they'll raise their hand. And then I'll ask if their data goes internationally, and they typically tilt their head at me, and I, I then bring up this slide. If you select the cloud, your data uh, can go anywhere that they have a presence, and that's why I have put this together. So it, even if you're not an international school, by your feeling or identity, you may have aspects of your school that are international to include the people and the data. So the people aspect matters tremendously when, with regard to GDPR, because if you have, even if you're not an international school by your reckoning, if you have international students, from, specifically from the EU, or international teachers, and you have personal data on them, and you may not recognize what personal data is, but it includes aspects that are, include their computer IP address, right, their, any information about their trade union management, their political opinions, how they click, anything about their biometric data, their genetic data, their philosophical beliefs, their ethnic or racial origin, their health data, there's so much more that is considered sensitive or personal data 
than what we might traditionally consider here in the United States. So you need to make sure that even as a non-EU organization, since you are offering a service to someone who is from the EU, that you are aware of GDPR or General Data Protection Regulation, right? So the good news is that you probably don't need to have a data protection officer, right? Because you are um, not doing systemic monitoring and you're not um, doing much, right? And you're not a public entity, things along that line. We may need a, a data protection officer, but I don't think you do. Uh, but you need to make sure that your data, especially for those EU folks, is protected, and that if if there is a breach of any sort, and they define personal data a little differently, but not that much differently than GLB, they define it as uh, a data breach, specifically as a breach of security leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure of or access to personal data that is transmitted, stored, or, or otherwise processed, right? So if you have uh, a breach of any sort, not only will you need to mod tell us, you may need to tell the regulatory authorities in Europe if you have that kind of data. And it's just to take that one step further, it's, it's from a U.S. perspective, it's EU citizens. If you were in the EU, it would be uh, EU citizens or residents, right? So you have a, l a little simpler time because you can establish that status and probably have as you accepted a, someone as an employee or as a uh, student. But I want you to take a moment to consider whether or not you have that status for every contractor or subcontractor. And then I want you to take a moment and think about whether you know that status for if you were a research institution for anyone who is in your research pool of data, right? Because this, this nugget gets very large very fast at the point where you consider it. And some of our biggest breaches have been of research data. It's not necessarily uh, financial data at that point, but it's institutional data, it's research data. So anyone who is a data subject, and they don't, they don't care why you have the data, but just make sure that you are lawful in your processing and that your collection includes explicit consent. And it can't be, it expressly cannot be like one thing in amongst a million, right? It has to be in simple, plain language that's actively acknowledged like an opt-in. And you have to make sure that everything is transparent and that they know exactly what you're doing with it and they have to be able to take the data from you and they have the right to have it erased, which is also more conversationally called the right to be forgotten, right? So if they decide to opt back out, you have to be able to remove them permanently from your system <laughs> under GDPR. So this is a tremendous change, especially over what we would say the GLB is. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands that they need to have the adequate level of data protection. They need to make sure their their rules are in place if they have any of these international aspects to them and that their contracts may also have to reflect GDPR just like GLB, right? And then uh, you, you have to make sure that uh, any personal data that you have can be made unidentifiable, right? So that if if they get to the point where they are concerned about it, that they can take care of it. Um, and again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just, I'm deep in data security. And so data protection is the flip side of, of uh, data privacy and data security, right? It's all the same triangle as it, as it were. 
So you just need to make sure that you have already done this aspect because far worse than just not being compliant is that there are serious fines associated with GDPR. And if you have not heard, it can range between 2% of your organization to 4%, capping out at 10 million euro to 20 million euro if you have a data breach um, that they consider significant and that you don't report in a variety of other factors. So non-compliance um, has an actual financial impact on your organization. So, um, and I don't, I don't know if you have 10 to 20 million euro lying around, but I know I don't. <laughs> um, and in fact, if I did, I probably wouldn't be on this call. So, um, <laughs> just make sure <laughs> that I might, you never know. Everyone needs a hobby, but, uh, just make sure that you have taken all of this into account. Um, the other thing that I like to tell U.S. Uh, institutions is that, as I was talking earlier, when you pick a cloud provider, you know, they can put your data anywhere in the world unless you pick one that is FedRAMP, F-E-D-R-A-M-P certified. Right, so I'm going to pick on Amazon here, and this is not me suggesting, condoning, or endorsing Amazon in any way. But if you were, say, to pick one uh, Amazon instance out of Oregon, and you know that AWS has a FedRAMP instance, if you don't specifically select and adopt a FedRAMP instance for your deployment, just because it's FedRAMP capable doesn't mean that you have a FedRAMP instance. You have to actively select it, kind of like consent with GDPR, right? And if it's not FedRAMP, that data could end up in any jurisdiction, uh, that uh, Amazon. It could end up in Brazil. It could end up in Singapore. I mean, you can see the map. So uh, my personal recommendation um, is to follow the same rules that a third-party servicer must which is keep the data in the United States um, and make sure that it is protected. Uh, the other thing um, that FedRAMP does not do for you is make sure that you have outlined in your contract how you're gonna get your forensic data. Like, so if you have a breach, one of the things we ask you for is how did you, um, how did you, know you had a breach, how do you know it didn't go lateral within your organization or within your cloud, things along that line, because it can happen very, very quickly. Um, I know of one place where they had just a sandbox, right? A sandbox is just a play place where there's no sensitive data, anything along that line. And they got an email saying, hey, we just saw that your key was out on the dark web, Amazon sent them that and you might want to um, take you know take a look and so went out and sure enough in the less than four hours that the key pair had been shared which is how you secure it an encryption key uh, they had several enormous instances that had been spun up under their account and they were being used to do attacks and other things across the globe. And in those four hours, they had already accumulated $36,000 in charges, right? Uh, so that they, the person acted immediately, shut down all those instances, changed the key pair, booted everybody from it. And they were, they were happily, because they responded within 10 minutes of that email, they were able to argue that they didn't, they weren't responsible for those charges and Amazon agreed. So please take for a moment to think about how, how big a deal it would be if you got, let's see, $9,000 an hour, cover that over the course of a month, but it, that, that's not, math isn't even accurate because it was growing exponentially it, and and some would argue it's growing logarithmically right because that was just what happened in the first four hours it wouldn't have stayed 
steady, but let's just do that math in our head for a minute of how much money that would be for nothing if, if that happened to you. So making sure that when you have clouds in place, making sure that your forensics uh, is uh, in place as well is critical because we will ask you for that evidence. And it may happen a year later. It depends on if you self-report right away, it won't be a year later. But if we find out through media or something like that, which unfortunately happens more often than not, then we'll ask you for that those logs. And if you haven't made the provisions for it, you may not even be able to get it. And even if you can get it, it may not be free. So it's important for you to know exactly how much it will cost you, right? Especially if you're considering whether you keep the processing or storage, you know, on your premises versus putting it in a cloud. Make sure that you know that and that it's expressly included in your contract. And again, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not trying to make you be a contract lawyer, but Making sure as you're considering these options that you're well informed will definitely save you so much heartache later. Um, and this is why I bring it up. So um, the other the other reason why jurisdiction matters, um, and it's again an EU situation. I was actually on the cloud delegation to the EU where we were trying to come up with all the rules. And one of the things we discussed was um, the fact that there isn't always the same legislation. Even within the EU, they're not uh, as much unified as they are uh, uh, European sometimes. So there was a, a story they told me about where there was a prosecutor in Italy who wanted to get data from Norway. And Norway, if you may or may not know, is very, very careful about data security and privacy. So Norway refused, and so the prosecutor uh, then went to Britain and then asked them to leverage the U.S. Patriot Act in order to get the data. And sure enough, they did, and they not only got the data, they got the whole hard drive. So if your data goes abroad, uh, it is subject to whatever laws are resident there. And you cannot predict, nor can your cloud provider, uh, where that goes. So let's say, let's pick on Oracle. You may think that your data you know, is sitting somewhere in Oklahoma, but actually it, it could be in UAE or in China. And that may not be where you want that data, whether it be financial data, intellectual property data, or your emails, right? So just be very cognizant of what you're doing. And I'm not saying don't go into the cloud. Um, granted, uh, when you have a breach in the cloud, it typically costs 20% more, but you may have exponentially lower savings. Uh, I know of one group that they were able to save 75% of their cost for data processing on a regular basis by going to the cloud. You need to do the math for your institution. But, um, and I personally love the cloud, but Make sure that it is fully formed and you're using facts, not feelings, and that you are doing all of the appropriate consideration because everyone will have an opinion, but you you need to make a decision. All right, so next slide, please. Hey, Tina, this is Marianne again. Before we before we jump in that, I know there's a couple of questions about the GDPR, and, and I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer these, they're, but I think they're quick and we can just kind of take care of them pretty quickly. The first is, uh, this is asked by Donna, and she says, my administration wants to know who, how the EU can fine us, make us pay for a breach. What is their authority over a U.S. institution? So there's, there, as their regulation is written, their authority is over EU citizens and EU data. So that will probably be an interesting litigation in the future. However, um, I can send a bill to anyone and you can choose whether or not you pay it. Uh, um, so, I, so, I mean, you might get a letter in the mail saying, hey, you caused a breach, you didn't report it, and uh, you, know, you are in violation. And I, I don't actually know what, if anything, they can do to enforce it on a US citizen, institution, things along that line. But um, I would hate, hypothetically, 
for something to happen where, and, and we see this in data security specifically, something happens, there's an incident, and people feel like they're getting away you know, scot-free until they take that trip to Amsterdam, and then all of a sudden that next tradition policy kicks in place. And so while we're not talking about criminal activities here, we're talking about civil matters, I would hate for your president to be abroad only to discover that you had received a letter with a fine of, oh, who knows how many euros, God forbid it's 20 million, and they can't leave the country until they pay it or something. Right. Like, I, I don't know. And it again, we are 85 days from this being instituted. So uh, it's, I, I mean, I have a little bag of popcorn just waiting, but I just want to make sure people know that it's out there and they're not surprised if they get that letter and they shouldn't disregard it, much like that email from Amazon, uh, right? You need to pay attention and, and you might want to make a corporate decision or an institutional decision about how you're going to handle that before the letter happens. Right, or you might want to make certain choices or include that in your criteria when evaluating people uh, or institutional contracts, I mean. So, you know, just just be aware that that is there. Is there a second question, Marianne? There is. And the, the next question is, and this too, I'm not sure if you can answer this one yet since we're still still working our way through this, but how can we erase student data and still keep records for transcripts, et cetera? So in other words, if a student asks to be forgotten, how, do, how would that work logistically for transcripts and whatnot? Right, so my assumption is that that would also even be against some of the other standards and norms that we have with regard to data, right? Because normally we like to preserve decisions and things along that line. Um, right. So what I would recommend, because what they're doing in Europe is that you have to have a formal process to apply for erasure, right? And you have to have that well documented. And then in lieu of a transcript, you would have to have a record of erasure instead. And uh, this would happen with the full knowledge and uh, consent of the student, and then uh, my assumption would be that you would have to report that erasure up um, so that it didn't look like a lost record or or yep. some sort of breach that you would have to say that we have you know we because this is not a law that um, Department of Education or FSA is going to be enforcing. However. You know, we want to be uh, good global citizens as well as American citizens and make sure that you, uh, you're you at least aware that this is a possibility and that just because you're within U.S. borders, it does not mean that it will not affect you. Right. No, it, it is a very... Right. Okay. And one, one last one last piece, and, I, and, I, and then we'll, we'll go on. I apologize. <laughs> But uh, you can see the GDPR is, is a hot topic for this group. Um, well, and, and it's we, coming fast, right? It is so, coming fast. I mean, it's been <laughs> a countdown clock is what we need. Um, oh, and, there actually is one on uh, eugdpr.org. Really? <laughs> yeah. There is. There is. There is. And it has a lot more data than me. So you're welcome to go out there. <laughs> we, we get asked this a lot. And I think this goes back to this residency. Um, question. Uh, folks are interested in knowing if they are doing online educational services to the military or uh, family of the military who happens to be in Germany, uh, but they obviously the institution has no physical presence there. Would that still count as having to worry about it? And the reason they're asking this, Tina, is because we do have several, well, more than several, quite a few institutions that honestly have no physical presence in the EU and also do not really um, offer their online educational services to anyone other than military independence. So I think what they're wondering is, is this something they need to worry about as well? Is this something they should take a second look at? So what I would say is, if they are US citizens living abroad and they have not declared themselves as EU residents in a formal way, right? Because you have to, like if you come to this country and you are here legally, you have to declare yourself a resident, 
right? So if that military person or family, depending on who they're offering classes to, has not made themselves uh, residents of Germany, residents of, they may be living there, but their legal status is not one of a resident. It is of a military person who is deployed and they're typically living on base mm -hmm. or something along that line, right? Or approved housing. Mm -hmm. um, then that I don't believe GDPR would apply unless they ask for it. And I can't see that happening. Um, so However, if they're offering the classes to the military and then their uh, EU-born wives, for example, as a hypothetical, or EU-born husbands as a hypothetical, then it may apply and you may need to take a second look at it. So you need, might need to be more restrictive in who you allow in um, if you consider that too much of a risk for your school. Or conversely, you just need to be become very familiar and adept at how do you report a data breach? Because it's, it, from a reporting perspective, it's actually a little looser than what we expect of educational institutions. They give a larger window to report. Um, however, um, they don't give you uh, the what we do. So we say, <laughs> on the day of detection, right? We say the day you detect it, they say from the day of the breach. So if you go four days and you haven't detected the <laughs> breach, you're in trouble Yeah, <laughs> because yeah. you're outside, <laughs> you have gone too far. Um, <laughs> so that that's an important distinction because we will give you credit for not knowing and they will not. So it's important to, it's important to know that that um, and so uh, yes, they may decide to clarify that it's 72 hours from detection, but right now it's just 72 hours from breach. So got it. Okay, that helps me. Thank you. And, excuse All me, Tina. Right. This so, is Daryl. I, I just wanted to. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry to have to be this person, but we're um, getting close to the top of the hour. And uh, what I think we're hearing here is there is a lot of information for us to cover. And actually, I would love to talk with you about the uh, about the ability for you to come back with us again on another day um, so we can talk more about this. There's obviously so much to share. So I was wondering with just uh, these few minutes left, if you could give just a, a your just brilliant statement of what everyone should be doing to move forward and then we're gonna have to turn it back over to Lindsay but I wanted everyone to know that we have these questions banked here and that we will be talking with Tina about answers to these questions and then sharing the answers back with the group um, after we've been able to do that but Tina if you wouldn't mind you know just uh, words of wisdom as we move forward please okay so I just want to make sure everyone sees what a breach is um, so that they understand that it's not just a hacker disclosure. It's very much like the GDPR. It includes misuse, alteration, destruction, compromise, unauthorized access, right? And it doesn't matter if it's digital or paper. So Lindsay, if you go forward, um, go forward a slide, right? So I've already mentioned out of day of detection. This is how you report a breach, right? You just email it and we can call it in or you can call me if you're afraid of whistleblower. And um, you can also uh, text me at 202-279-0269. Next slide. I have some tools out on my website. Let's go past forward three slides. <laughs> so there's the CAT tool. There's a compliance framework, which includes GDPR. There's me. There's my mobile. Uh, there's a com cybersecurity compliance page where all of this is. And then the last slide is the one where it's the next step. So go back home, make sure you have a program, make sure that you have someone in charge of it, make sure you're doing your testing, you're monitoring, that you're changing. And if you have all of that, you're in the top 1%, kudos to you. Make sure you put your contact information, not your PII, but your contact information about this program on your website. Because what I will do is if you're having a breach, I will look at your website and see who to call. And if it's not posted, I'm calling your president. So. It's important for you to do step six here, which is talk to your president, your executive team, and make sure they know. Because as bad as a breach day would be, it's so much better if you already have it buttoned up and they know that I'm coming. 
Very well done. That was fast and furious, but I loved it. That was great and very helpful. And these slides will be available for everyone. We are recording this webcast. And as Cheryl pointed out, we absolutely will have Tina back because I think as we move forward, we're going to have more to share and more questions to ask uh, and more ways to kind of delve deep into this. So a big, big thank you to Tina. Really appreciate your time today. Um, and answering the questions as they came up. I know I need to throw this back to Lindsay at this point, uh, but before I do, Cheryl, did you have anything you wanted to add? I'm sorry, I was on mute. I just wanted to thank you all for being with us today and thank you so much to Tina for being with us and sharing this really wonderful information. And we, um, I definitely want to talk to you about uh, trying to uh, get you to visit with us again. Thanks so much for, for such a wonderful presentation um, and very thorough. And then I'll hand it off to Lindsay. Thank Lindsay? you all so much to our wonderful moderators and uh, Tina, a huge round of applause, uh, like Marianne and Cheryl said, for today's webcast. I check out our handout section in the webinar panel, or we will be posting our um, all of these resources on the WCET website within a week. So you can see information on staying connected and learning more about the state authorization network, as well as our state authorization basic compliance workshop coming up in June. And you can learn more about the WICHE Cooperative for Educational Technologies at WCET witchy.edu come join our conversations we have some great events coming up this year uh, our leadership summits in Newport Beach California we hope you can learn more and, and join us to talk about ensuring ethical and equitable access in digital learning and we're celebrating our 30th annual meeting this year in October and again just a reminder all these resources the handouts and the PowerPoint and the recording will be available at this URL within a week we'll also email that out to you guys Join us next month for our upcoming webcast, Collaborative Course Design. And a huge thank you to our WCET supporting members for your continued commitment to WCET and our annual sponsors. Without you, many of our events and initiatives would not be possible. And hey, thank you to everyone who participated and sent in questions today. We really appreciate you joining us for our webcast. Have a great day.